It's good to see everybody. I uh, told Brother David uh, that I wanted to say a few words about uh, the uh, foster closet that we're preparing to be involved with and uh, on Wednesday when I do the class and primarily so you can ask questions if you want to and see uh, and tell you where we are but uh, it won't take the entire class. We'll, we'll do a Bible study, and that'll be prim, primarily the class. But I, I do want to take that opportunity to talk about that and, and also what we're going to try to do uh, uh, different with Christian e-learn for those that might be interested. If you have your Bibles, please turn to First Chronicles chapter 21. We're going to, going to read quite a bit. You know, I, I, I'm going to have to talk to Josh. I, I wish he wouldn't build me up so much. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, you know, it's uh, not a special treat. In fact, uh, I, I just love to hear Josh uh, preach, and I think he does a great job, but I, I know he's being nice to me, but uh, it's not that special of a treat for me to be up here. But I, I appreciate that. The, the treat will be in learning from God's Word, right? Uh, learning something uh, maybe new um, that we can apply to, uh, to our life. First Chronicles chapter 21, we're going to read most of the chapter as we uh, learn about an event here um, uh, when uh, David was king. And uh, there is uh, one verse that we're going to narrow in as we get the full picture uh, for our study tonight. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So Satan was involved here in, in tempting David to, to number the children of Israel, to kind of like a, a census uh, type thing, but maybe a little bit more it seems to number the army and how many men they had to fight, so forth. So David said, to Joab and to the leaders of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all the Lord, my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? You see, Joab uh, knew that what David wanted to do was against God's will, and David knew it too. But keep in mind, Satan here tempted David to do this. Verse 4, Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. He didn't really finish the command, did he? But he got enough. He got the main uh, ones here and... And that was enough, I guess, Joab thought. So he gives the numbers to David. And verse 7, And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. So David had a change of heart. He realized what he had done and uh, ask God's for forgiveness. Then the Lord, it says in verse 9, spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. You know, we can get forgiveness of our sins, but sometimes there's consequences that we have to endure. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself. And he's going to give him three options here. God says you choose which punishment you want me to give you. Either three years of famine, which would have caused 
many people to die. Or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you. And of course that would have been a number of people to have died. Or three days the sword of the Lord. The plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now, he says, consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. Verse 13, and David said to Gad, I am in great distress because let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. Man's cruel. Uh, Justice we receive from man far greater than the mercies of God. David knew that. Verse 14, so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders clothed in sackcloth sackcloth fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? At least David, he's owning up to it. He is saying, punish me, not uh, my people. Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Verse 18, therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Here we see this particular place. This is where the angel stopped. He still got his, uh, his, the sword drawn to smite some more. And it's at this particular place that is called the threshing floor of of Ornan, the Jebusite. Now we know the Jebusites were a tribe that had been conquered by Joshua. But they were allowed to live in Jerusalem and and they were not loyal to God. But still we had some of these Jebusites uh, that lived in Jerusalem. Verse 20, now Ornan turned and saw the angel. And his four sons who were with him hid themselves. But Ornan continued threshing wheat. Can't you just see it? You know, the kids run off scared to death, but the old man is still threshing wheat. He's uh, even seeing the angel uh, and what was going on. So David came to Ornan. And Ornan looked and saw David, and he went out from the threshing floor bowed before David with his face to the ground. You know, David was king. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Oh, David says, I want to buy this place. God has told me to, to, you know, uh, offer sacrifice here, so uh, I need need your place. Now, I'm willing to pay the full price. But Ornan said to David, take it to yourself and let my lord, the king, do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also give you the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. Well, how, how strange. I mean, well, that was great uh, to offer all of these things. He evidently knew what was required for the sacrifice. And he says, Don't, not only do you take the threshing floor, the place here, but, uh, you know, take the oxen, take the wood, do, take everything. 
to do what you need to do. I mean, by the you're king, right? You don't have to pay me the full price. You just take it. Verse 24. Then King David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. Well, why is David being so insistent? He says, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. There's our lesson. We'll get back to it, but let's go on. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. He bought it. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of the burnt offering. So the Lord commanded the angel, and he returned his sword to its sheath. What a story. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, just so many instances in the Old Testament uh, where there are lessons that we can learn, principles, I guess would be more of what we would call this, a principle that I think applies to us, and that goes back to verse Uh, 24, where David said, and you might, I would underline this. This is a great lesson. I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. Not going to do that. I'm not going to give to God something that doesn't cost me something. Many today want what is sometimes called a cost-free religion. We don't want to offer anything to God, or at least some people. uh, No, they won't even darken, as we say, the door of a church building. I don't want to have anything to do with God. I'm not going to offer anything to God. Some are uh, willing to offer lip service. And we read about that in the Bible, don't we, where Jesus said in Matthew 15, he said, uh, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And there's still others that are willing to give sacrificially, if you will, to some extent, maybe not, not sacrificially, but they're willing to give some, but not sacrificially, not out of an inconvenience. You know, yeah, I'll go to church and as uh, long as it doesn't uh, uh, conflict with my schedule, <laughs> what I want to do. And so cost them a little bit, but not really that much. I want us to consider tonight that a religion that cost us very little is going to mean very little to us. Would you agree with that? And really that could be applied to many things in life. Something that we haven't invested ourselves in that doesn't cost us much is not really going to mean that much to us. What a privilege it is to be a child of God, to be a Christian, to have all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. It came to us, though, with a great, great cost. It cost to bring us those uh, those blessings. First of all, it cost God, cost him his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It cost Jesus. Jesus emptied himself, came down from heaven, gave his life, suffered on the cross. He didn't want to do, right? So it was a lot of cost for Jesus. And it cost us. Matthew 16 24, we find of three ways, and we'll talk about him in detail more in a minute, but where he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. In regards to this, sometimes we may ask the question, 
Why are some people stronger Christians than others? Never wondered that. Well, it's their upbringing, right? I don't think that's the excuse. Why are they more committed than others to the gospel? Why do they work harder? Why does it mean more to them? Why are they more spiritually minded? You ever thought of that? I think the answer is right here. Why is a congregation stronger maybe than another congregation? The answer is here. Their service to God costs them something. They've invested The more we invest ourselves in it, the more it means to us. And it shows. For instance, an example might be, what about somebody who has invested a lot in the stock market? Where do you think they're going to turn? You know, we used to get a newspaper and open it up. (laughs) We don't do that as much anymore. Maybe it's on the phone, but what what are they going to be interested in? Well, what's the stock market doing today, right? you have a stock in John Deere or somewhere, you know, someplace, you're going to be interested in what that stock is doing. Why? Because you're invested in that. A lot of time and effort is involved in that. What about a person who goes out and buys a, a, maybe a hundred head of cattle? That cost quite a bit, wouldn't it? Get a hundred head at one time. You think he's going to be interested in the well-being of those cows? Oh, man, I remember every time I think I see it snowing hard and I I see how cold and that wind was blowing out there. And and I I remember as dad would say, we've got to get out there and feed the cows. (laughs) They've got to be fed. Uh, It was some tough times, you know, good memories in some ways. But still, there was an investment there. And you had to get out there and do the work because of, um, in order for it to be a success. Maybe to be a better Christian, a stronger Christian, a greater faith, we know is involved in study of God's word, but it's maybe in a more general way, it's if we just would invest ourselves more, just put our heads down and work more, Just do more for other people. We'll become stronger. Stronger Christians. What what would it mean to the church, I wonder, if every Christian would invest themselves more in our worship service? For instance, listening to a sermon. I know I'm not the greatest speaker in the world. Uh, I've put people to sleep before. I know that. But, you know, sometimes I come in here real tired, and, and, and I hope I've never discouraged Josh, but, but I'm not as alert as I should be, and my mind might want to wander a little bit. But I'm determined to never, and I hope you will too, but to never listen to a sermon or a lesson from God's Word without giving it a lot of effort, focusing my attention on that. I will not offer to God as part of my worship and and listening to His Word, I will not offer to God anything that does not cost me something. What about singing? You know... (laughs) I I can't sing near as well as I used to. I don't feel like I can. I don't know what's coming out of my voice sometimes. It just goes different places. Some of you can't carry a tune. I have at least in the past been able to carry a tune. I know that. We're, We're not all have that abilities. We're still commanded to sing. We gotta sing. Got to try. 
Try to sing. As it says in Colossians 3.16, as we know, a verse that's common to us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, how much effort do I have to give to that? You know, sometimes I'm tired. <laughs> Singing takes effort. It just does. I mean, some of our singing nights, we'll get on the seventh or eighth song, and I'm, I'm wearing out. I don't know about you, and my voice is too, and, and, and it takes effort to sing. And especially if you're trying to sing loud enough, how loud should we sing? Well, it uh, says that we need to teach and admonish one another. If I can't hear you, you're not teaching or admonishing me. Now, I know we can't sing loud enough to cover the whole building, but we've got to, you know, from the scripture here, we've got to reach somebody, you know, to, that can hear us. And hopefully they'll be kind enough, if your voice is horrible, <laughs> that they won't turn around and look at you. If their heart's right, they won't. But they know you're doing what God says to do. I, 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 the last singing night, I got to get up and lead a song. And David Futro was right here, and, and Carolyn Tao was over here. And David, I think, was singing tenor, and Carolyn was singing alto, I believe. And, I, and, and they were singing out. And the first thing when I got up there and I started to lead, I thought, and they, they were, you know, coming at me, and I thought, alto, tenor, and I'm singing soprano or trying to, I'll never keep the tune. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever done that, Tom. I'll never keep it on key. But, you know, I think it all worked out. And I thought at, at the end of that song, I thought I wish everybody had been able to be up here and heard how beautiful that was. Great singing. It all seems to come out in the wash. If you're a little off over here, somebody else might be off the other way. And, and I know it's what's from the heart that counts. I've heard people behind me that was so off, I couldn't hardly keep on at all. But I could tell they were singing from the heart. That was more beautiful than any sound that, you know, I could hear. They meant every word. So we need to sing. We need to sing out, and that's important. We need to, to give it the effort that it desire, uh, deserves and uh, to please, please God. Well, what about partaking of the Lord's Supper, the same thing? Oh, you know, people say, well, I don't like to go to funerals. I don't like those sad events. But there's value in going to funerals. Some of the young people that say, I don't want to go, you need to go to funerals. You need to, we all need to be reminded of the brevity of life and so forth. We know that. And when we surround this table and we think about what Jesus has done for us, that he died for me, for my sins, put him there, and your sins. You see, that, that's sad to me but he wants us to remember that never forget it to commemorate that and that takes effort I don't want to do that no but I need to it's good for me so I have to have effort I have to focus on that I have to go back to the scene of the cross I have to remember what all he went through it again takes effort of course, we just talked about how that the, the Jesus, his grief and suffering that he went through for us. As we examine ourselves, partake in a worthy manner. What about prayer? 
I will not pray to God if it doth cost me nothing. Again, we pray often, hopefully. Sometimes it can get mundane possibly to us. But we shouldn't offer any time something to God that does cost me nothing. I need to give it my all when I'm praying to God. And when we think about who we're going before as we pray, God Almighty is hearing our prayers. And then what about giving? Giving the really, I guess, uh, more directly answers the question. I will not give of my means if it doth cost me nothing. It's sacrificial giving. It's the type of giving that you give up something else in order to give to God. I had a preacher one time tell me, good friend of Jane and I, and we've known him many years, and he told me in confidence one time, and he wasn't bragging, but he said, you know, said the wife and I have decided many years ago we would give 50% of everything we uh, brought in, 50%. I just put me to shame. <laughs> I don't know about you all. I said, Michael, how do you make it that? How did you raise two daughters? And he said, never had a want, never re really needed anything. I'm not saying that you have to give 50%. I don't think the scriptures even teach that you have to do that. But I'll tell you what. Those two people are one of the hardest working people in the church. Why? They gave something that cost them something. They sacrificed. They invested their life in the church. And it made a difference. And it, and it shows uh, in, their, in their life. Do we want to be stronger? Do we want to be more committed? Let it cost us something. Put ourselves into it. Let us give more time. Let us give more of our talents, whatever we have. Let us just endeavor to give more. And I think we'll be stronger Christians. We'll be a stronger congregation. I'm so excited about the little Foster's Closet. And you all have responded, as I've said already, so, so greatly. I know many of you are already invested in your religion. But maybe we can do more. Jesus said in Matthew or Mark 8, 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, one, take up his cross, three, follow me. There's cost involved in all three of those things, if you think about it. First one, deny yourself. Jesus said, you remember, not my will, but thy will be done. We're denying our will. Je Jesus said, you can't come after me unless you're willing to deny yourself, deny your will. It's not our will anymore. How did Paul say it? He says, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Not me anymore. Take up his cross. I can't help but go back to the passage when I think about this. Well, you remember in John chapter 6 where Jesus was, was telling the multitudes, the people that were following him at that time, and, and he told them, you're going to have to eat of my flesh, you're going to have to drink of my blood in order to follow me. And they thought about it, they struggled with it, and Finally, the scripture says many of them walk no more with him. What a sad time it would have, must have been for Jesus. 
many of them didn't work walk with him anymore. They saw the cost that was going to be involved. And then, of course, Jesus turned to his apostles. Will you all also go away? And oh, that's when Peter, boy, he really shone sometimes. He said, you know, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Take up your cross. Yeah, there's a cost there. But at the same time, um, as Peter said, where else are you going to go for eternal life? You, know, you either pay it or you don't. Thirdly, he says, follow me. And of course, we all know what that means as we learn in Scripture uh, what we must do. We're willing to do it. Just as Nike said uh, on their tennis shoes, just do it. And uh, then we can be his disciple. Yes, it cost. It cost a great deal. It cost everything that we have. Everything you have. We talked about this morning in our class. And people need to understand when they come to Jesus, I think, that, that it would... Be good to tell them, now you realize this is going to cost you everything. Your will, there's going to be burdens to bear, and you're going to have to follow Jesus in every decision you make. And then if they're still willing to put on Christ in baptism, I think they'll be, they will have counted the cost and Hopefully, we'll continue on. If you are not a Christian tonight and you want to become one, uh, we certainly encourage you to do that. Who else has the words of eternal life? And we know to f we have to follow him, but we first deny ourselves, be willing to take up our cross and follow him. And that starts, of course, we know by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And a lot of people can get that far, I think. They, at least superficially, uh, they don't have a problem with believing that there was Jesus and that he was the Son of God. But then repentance comes along, and repentance is hard to do for many people. To change our life. And, and Josh talked a lot about that this morning, didn't he? Uh, the change sometimes that's required to really, ultimately, I think it is denying self. Not my will anymore. I can't go that direction. But it's your will. That's a form of repentance. Of course, you can get into the details of that. Confession. To confess him. Be willing to confess Jesus' name before others. I believe that singing, as we've talked about, is a means of confessing Christ. I mean, what don't we do that? When we sing and we praise God and those beautiful songs we sing, we have the opportunity to confess him before others and to admonish and teach others. Jesus is Lord. And of course, uh, confession, repentance, and then being baptized for the remission of our sins. Galatians 3.27, Acts 2.38, many passages, Romans chapter 6, uh, first six or so verses, all teach us the importance of baptism. It is where we are worked on by God for a lay expression, I guess. It's where God does something to us. The other things are things we do. We have to believe, we have to repent, we have to confess, but then when we submit to that watery grave of baptism, then God works on us. He removes our sins, gives us a clean slate. He adds us to his church. How beautiful that is. 
you want to do that tonight or if, if you are a Christian that need the prayers of the church, whatever way that we can help you, won't you come as together we stand and sing.